I first presented this talk at uh, Melbourne Ruby uh, in, back in January, and Brett liked it so much he asked me to represent this talk to everyone here. Um, anyway, let's get started. So today I'm talking about how your build pipeline is a product. Um, so hi, I'm Chendo, uh, sometimes known as my real name, Jack Chen, but people know me by that, so it's just why I call myself now. Uh, you can find me on GitHub and Twitter under at Chendo. Um, I am the CTO at My Doctor, and I previously worked at LifeX and Envato uh, in here in Melbourne, and I also created Shortcut and the fuzzy autocomplete plugin for Xcode. So, if you've ever been stuck in a waiting room with all the other sick people, your doctor's running an hour late, and all you want is something simple like a prescription, a medical certificate, or a referral, then this product is for our product is for you. So the app is uh, our primary product is My Doctor Go, which lets you have a consultation with the doctor through your smartphone, and the doctor can issue medical, a medical certificate, prescriptions, referrals, pathology, imaging, like an X-ray or a CT scan, and we ship to iOS, Android, and web. So a bit of context around uh, the, the talk. So our stack is a Rails backend, which is deployed as a set of containers to a DCOS cluster. Uh, we have a React frontend, which is deployed to mobile using Cordova as a hybrid app. And we use um, ES6, Flow, GraphQL style components for that. And we also use BuildKite for CI, which is what I understand Zendesk also uses, correct? No? It's Travis. OK, never mind. Must be some other company then. Sorry. Um, so. Why is a build pipeline a product? Because some of you might be thinking, you know, why is it a product? We don't sell it. Doesn't really make us money directly. But ultimately, I see a product as something that has uh, provides some sort of value. So in this case, it prevents bugs and automates processes that would otherwise be manual and painful to be done otherwise. And it also has users, which is you. So why treat it as a product? I mean. We deal with computers for a living, and that's painful enough as it is. Why treat a pipeline as a product? And the idea is so you can apply the typical product design principles and processes around it, so you can then iterate and improve on the pipeline, and ultimately to keep your developers happy. So I guess raise your hand if you've had an issue with uh, your pipeline in the last month or so. Yeah, so that this talk is for you, right? So. Um, <laughs> All right, so let's look at the uh, the user experience flow of a typical build pipeline. Because you know every product has a user, has a user experience, and in our case, uh, to for us to use CI, uh, we usually push a change after making a bunch of changes. We wait for the build to happen, and if it broke, if it breaks, we figure out what broke and why, and then ideally we would fix it. And hopefully, we'd also ensure that the broken tests are fixed locally first before pushing up to CI, but in some cases, that's impractical. And then we push the fix and then rinse and repeat. So we're, uh, I'm going to take you through the, uh, the evolution of our front-end build pipeline specifically, because this is uh, the most interesting one. Um, uh, this was, um, I previously haven't dealt with a front-end pipeline before, because most, most of the products I've worked in the past are mostly backend focused, but um, as part of a this job, I uh, to figure out how to make testing the I, the mobile apps feasible and not painful, like most of the, like like testing iOS apps normally are. So, um, I don't like writing JavaScript. I mean, uh, that's just me from uh, dealing with JavaScript for uh, for all the years. But it has gotten a lot better. So there's uh, obviously stuff like ES6. You get Flow, which is amazing. I uh, want to get it working. Um, and uh, I've already been familiar with testing Ruby apps. Uh, um, I work with I work with Dr. Nick for two years. If that name rings a bell to anyone, he did a lot of stuff around uh, Ruby testing back in the day, and was really, really into hardcore TDD, which I now disagree with. But I learned a lot about testing of these with him, um, and I wasn't really familiar with the JavaScript testing space. So I've decided that integration tests provide the most confidence. Um, you can have you can have 100% coverage with unit tests, but it means nothing if things don't work well together. And I thought, how hard could it be, right? Um, so the first iteration, uh, we, uh, I, looked, I did a, bit, a bunch of research and looked at a bunch of different testing 
solutions for JavaScript, and we came across Nightwatch, which is um, a JavaScript uh, testing tool. Seemed relatively popular with like 5,000 subs on GitHub, which is you know how we picked it, which is how we pick technologies these days. Uh, it's, it's active, which is good. And given that the back end is a separate repo, so we have a back end repo and a front end repo, uh, yeah, um, it didn't make sense to not use JavaScript to do, to do integration testing. Um, and we use Docker Compose to spin up the back end, the front end, and uh, the testing container and Selenium at the same time, so it's easy to sort out. And this is what it looks like, or well, this is what the output of it looks like. So you can see the title, you can see assertions, you can see um, some sort of backtrace that isn't, isn't immediately helpful. Uh, so the issues that we had with this was uh, there was a lot of effort to figure out what broke and why, which sucks when you're trying to figure out how to fix it quickly. Uh, you need to look at the test source to figure out what happened before it failed, which is useful to figure out you know, if there's anything before that that might cause a problem. Uh, the screenshots that the tool generated were very annoying to look at. And ultimately, you need to run the test locally to see the JavaScript errors. Um, but the real kicker was we didn't have a way to test our video chat call flow, right? So we, were, we had to then still do manual testing across um, multiple clients to see if the video chat still worked, which is a key component of our application. So that wasn't that was a problem because we couldn't test it. Um, it was also a bad developer experience, which is a term that's been tossed around these days. It's just UX, but with developers, but that's the thing. Um, there was a yeah, manual waiting you had to do, um, which was annoying. Uh, you had to do promise chaining, which is bullshit, ultimately. Um, and ultimately, the thing that made us move away from the tool was uh, there's a function called set value, which sets a value of a form, right? But it's actually a pen value. Um, so I was like, that can't possibly be right, right? So uh, I went to their GitHub and found the issue was actually filed in 2014. Um, actually, and it's bad enough, I'm, I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So yeah, 2014, February, um, someone else raised the issue and uh, gave an example and then what happened? Uh, it was closed by um, this is a low priority issue, so they'll close it. And you have all these other people being like, what's the deal with this? This doesn't make any sense. Can we open this? Look at all the plus ones. Oh, that's me. Um, and yeah, more people, more people, more people, more people, and it was last updated 11 days ago, the same thing. So after I saw this, I was like, cannot trust anything else about this tool if it can't get something so simple right. And uh, so, I mean, this is, oh, this is what I, I test written and that looks like, which as you can see, the manual weights, which is terrible, the chaining stuff, it's, it's all bad. And this is, the, this is the example they're advertised on the website as well. So, yeah, anyway, so one of the goals is we want to decrease the effort to understand failure, where effort is a combination of time and cognitive load, so the amount of mental effort you have to do to figure out what happened. Because the more brain power you spend on figuring what the failure was, the less you can spend on actually fixing the problem. Another goal was to make writing tests not suck, because in most cases, writing tests is a chore and it's painful. And with integration tests, you kind of you, you write something that feels like it could work, and then you run it, you gotta wait because it takes forever. Something breaks for some stupid reason, you fix it, rerun, and it's bloody painful, right? So and it's worse for longer the integration test is, which tends to be pretty long when you're testing something complicated. So the second iteration, um, we use RSpec and KPBara. So it took a lot of thinking to decide whether or not it's appropriate to use a Ruby, like a, to use Ruby as a testing language, even though it's on a Ruby project. But in the end, KPBara is very mature. It's been around for a long time. And it's very easy to write tests for, so in the end, uh, that's what we decided to use. Uh, we also implemented JS console output, so the actual JavaScript console appears in the test output, which is phenomenal. Um, there's a interactive test writing feature that we added, which I'll demo to in a second. Um, there's video call test, so we can actually now test the video call stuff end to end with two Chrome sessions, and actually does WebRTC handshake everything, which is fantastic. 
uh, we have step-by-step -step output via uh, the Ruby's Tracepoint API. So I actually thought about using Cucumber just so I can get the step-by-step -step output, but enough people said, no, don't use Cucumber anymore, it's crap now, that I actually decided, okay, fine, we won't use it, but I found some other way to do the output. And we also added screenshots being displayed near the error point, which is fantastic. So this is what the output looked like after that iteration. So uh, you can see all the uh, lines being printed out. Uh, ignore the double print because that's a bug that we have since fixed, I hope. You can get the, uh, what the JavaScript console looks like, which is fantastic. So if it was a JavaScript error that caused a failure, you know what the error is and you can begin to fix it without having to run the test locally. And you get the screenshot below, which is also quite good. Um, this is a video of the, uh, of the, of the call process. So as you can see, we went with a, uh, a house theme because it's a medical application and it made sense. Um, so you can tell Chrome to, uh, to simulate the WebRTC by having that spinner. So it sends that video across the WebRTC um, wire, so to speak. So yeah, so you know, it plays, it does tests, do all those things, it's nice. Um, I'll quickly show the uh, the interactive test writing because I think that's very cool and very useful to a lot of people. Um, right. Can everyone read that? Yeah. So um, yeah, so we run our tests inside from Docker containers. So we have a separate container for. Uh, uh, the application running um, on Webpack. We have the Rails backend uh, loaded in as well. We have Selenium as a separate container, and we have the RSpec test as its own container and the database as, as its own container. So it was amazing when I had this new machine, I installed Docker for Mac, and I, make, I ran make test with nothing else, and it, it took a long time to fetch everything and build it, but the test ran and passed the first time with nothing else apart from Docker installed, which is amazing. So. Uh, we access the, All right, so, um, so we use VNC to connect into the Selenium instance so we can see what's going on. So uh, I've added, I've added um, this Go Interactive uh, function which drops you out into like, kind of like an IRB. Uh, so you can type in anything that would, that would write in a test here and it will run it. So for example, fill in email address with through at bar.com, and that does that, right? So you can also touch on invalid, like email, whatever, with, doesn't really matter, and KB Bio will be smart and try, keep trying until the timeout collapses before it says, no, I can't find what you're looking for. Can't remember what we set the timeout to, but, so you get that, <coughs> so okay, okay, cool, I'll do the other thing, password with secure password, and does it right, right? So this lets you kind of walk through and write the tests without having to constantly break out the flow. So this is so much easier to write tests with. I actually um, adapted this from a Cucumber uh, library I wrote in 2007, um, which did the same thing for both the Cucumber steps, so it was good. And then you can type dot list, and that gives you the commands that pass, so you can just copy and paste them into your test, which is great. Yeah. Right, so even then, there were still issues with this iteration. Um, the error in the backtrace was at the end of the output, which gets more annoying with the longer test suite that we had. So, because you would see that it errored, but you had to then go, go back up to find out what happened before it errored, which wasn't great. Uh, you had to scroll through a lot of output to find the actual issue, uh, which is just a waste of time, really. Uh, the current notifications were annoying, so we had, you could either get them through email, which is noisy enough as it is, and the Slack integration, you would see everyone's bills in a channel, which is not, access, not exactly to you, the team. So we have a couple of goals that come out, came out from that. Decreased effort to know the build failed. So that's more about not having to, to check your email, not having to go to the build page and refresh and all that stuff. 
Um, so for the third iteration, also the other goals I've mentioned are still in effect, just with adding goals now. Um, we hit the unnecessary output. So if you don't use build kite, this is probably not as useful to you. And I'll show you what this looks like in a second, but it collapses all the output that for, it collapses all the output for the tests that passed. So you only see the output for the tests that failed. So you don't have to scroll through the massive backlog. Uh, we built a Slack bot that gives you need to know notifications. So I'll show you what this looks like in a second. But this will effectively ping you uh, through DM on Slack about your build or uh, also like GitHub comments and stuff because that was a bonus side effect of doing that. Uh, we move the error and backtrace into with the other output so it's easy to grok what happened. And we also added per step JS console output, which uh, I'll also show you. So this is the collapse by default output. So uh, you can, for, uh, in BuildKite, if you format the output prefix with uh, three dashes and a space, it turns them into a header. So this just breaks it down to this. So when, when this failed, it expands that automatically. And you also get the side effect of having uh, test runtimes, uh, well, section runtimes on the side. These are the stack notifications. So, uh, the, so we, we tap into the build, uh, the GitHub uh, commit status API. So anything that changes gets pushed into here. Um, we also got issue comments as I as a win. So if uh, some comments on your pull request, you get pinged on Slack rather than having to wait through GitHub emails as well. Uh, it also works with pull request comments. So, uh, so you can comment on a line and then it will kind of give you a bit of the output of where they commented around, which is nice. So again, less having to go to GitHub. And the per step JavaScript log looks like this. So after every line, it grabs a current log. So you can see uh, there was a warning printed um, after that line and so forth. So you can see all the errors closer to what may have caused it, which is a definite win. So even again, there's still issues. Um, there's still the need to do manual testing to, to, work, to verify that things work visually. So this is like if we um, uh, made a design change or front end change, it's, you still don't know whether or not that broke or not. Uh, the build still took too long. It was like 15 minutes, uh, which was just long, too long so that a dev, uh, sorry, a dev would break out of their flow before getting back into it and all that stuff. Um, we had an issue with concurrent front end builds on the same machine, which will cause it to grind to a halt because when you have uh, Selenium with WebRTC testing, you have the back end, you have um, all that stuff, it does chew up quite a, uh, quite a couple of cores. And so the test began failing due to timeouts because of additional load. So the goals that we came from that, uh, that we got from that was faster feedback cycle. So ultimately anything you want a faster feedback cycle because that's the best way to be faster. And the other part was must be able to trust results. So raise your hand if your, your build pipeline issues were due to them being unreliable. That's, that's not too bad, it's not too bad. Um, and the final goal, prevent undesired visual changes. So iteration four this time, uh, we added visual regression with Percy.io. Uh, it was super easy to integrate because it uh, had capybara support. So we have a function called snapshot and then the name of the screen and that, that's all we had to do. Um, apart from some uh, hacks we had to do because uh, there's a JavaScript issue where you can add styles to a CSS to a style tag, but that's only in memory and doesn't actually get represented in the style tag output. So when uh, so the way Perfect works is it takes a snapshot of the page, um, and then uploads that to, to their servers. So it can do responsive diffs and everything with one bit of content uh, with one bit of text. But our styles were broken. But anyway, that's a that's a different story to get down to. Um, we parallelize the test with Knapsack. Um, so Knapsack is a gem that uh, you can easily parallelize uh, tasks with, which works better with the build kite model of testing. We restructured our build kite agents um, so that each, uh, each machine had two agents that were tagged as high CPU, and the other three are just normal. So uh, we prevented too much load on being too much test, too much load from the test on the front end to impact the other tests, which is good. We added RSpec retry, which is just a, not the best way, but the easiest way to just retry the test. It, it, it retries the tests a configurable number of times. We do it three times to make sure it's actually failing before we continue. 
is not the best solution, but it makes the test more reliable, which is okay until we have time to figure out why it's not reliable. The visual regression, uh, regression testing looks like this. So uh, this is a change that we change um, our operating hours screen because our app has operating hours because doctors aren't available all the time. So it shows you uh, what was before, what, what was last approved, and what the diff is. So, so you can tab between those two views and uh, see what the, what's changed. Because then you hit approve to say someone actually looked at it and proved that these changes are okay. It's good. Uh, this is how we implemented it. So, uh, so this is um, from a test of ours. Uh, ignore the DRE, that's our old brand that we recently just rebranded. Um, so as a doctor, I someone as a doctor, should see some text. And then the snapshot line uh, tags that screen as doctor consultation available. So that's the heading you see in Percy. So you can go, okay, this screen is meant to do this. And it's a way for them to um, match uh, the visual diffs across test runs. And then we have snapshots for the patient side uh, as well, which is great. So the parallelized, uh, the parallelized tests, um, we split it across three machines, and we got the build down to five minutes, which is really good for a, for a front-end integration test suite, which is pretty good. Um, uh, actually, it's not part of this talk, because I did this before, but there's a Knapsack Pro with a Q mode, which uh, balances the tests across machines via queuing mechanism, which is even better because one of our build nodes is slower than the others. So if you just balance the tests equally, assuming that the performance is going to be the same, you're going to have slightly longer run times on the crappier node. So we, we did that, which is, I haven't covered in this talk, but strongly recommend. So ultimately, the summary of what we've done, uh, significantly decreased the effort to understand failure through percept logging, JS console output, Percept JS console output actually, screenshots, localizing the information to prevent jumping around, and hiding the relevant output. Um, and we also improved the confidence with visual regression testing. Uh, we improved the feedback cycle, which is through a fast test suite, uh, notifications rather than polling for uh, the build state. We made running the integration test much easier, which definitely helped. Like we say, countless hours by just having that simple change, and in the end, it resulted in happy develop well, happier developers. I mean, we can always find something to, to complain about. Um, the future roadmap um, of our pipeline was to have the backend logs in the output as well, so when it caused an issue with the backend, we can see that without having to then do the other thing, but that's a more difficult problem, and we haven't needed it yet. We want to get the relevant build output as well into the notifications, so you don't have to go to, to your CI service at all. Uh, per step screenshots or like a video so we can kind of see what happened before things went wrong. Oh, what is that? Uh, rebuild and, and unblock build some Slack, which I think someone's working on, but uh, hasn't been that important yet. And the holy grail of automated on device integration testing using the same test suite, which uh, I have a prototype and does work, just needs more time to automate the getting it onto the iPhone process. Um, so in conclusion, your build pipeline is a product and you should improve it. So your tooling and your processes are also products and you should also improve them. Uh, and that's it. Any questions?